Welcome to the Pilgrim's Well podcast. Pilgrim's Well is a resource for Christians wherever they are in their journey. We're excited to have you join us on this next episode. Hello, and welcome to our next episode of the Pilgrim's Journey, where we continue in this enchanted ground. And on the enchanted ground, Christian and Hopeful are feeling drowsy. There's a temptation to want to fall asleep and to stop the journey. But here, Hopeful is talking, or wanting to talk with Christian about having spiritual conversations. And within that, they're able to keep awake as they're going through this. So with each section that we go through, um, this is all pretty long, but it's all within this chapter, we encounter these spiritual conversations conversations that they're having with each other. So the first one is Hopeful is testifying to his conversion at Vanity Fair. Christian says, suggesting a topic to Hopeful, let me ask you a question. How did you first come to think about what you are doing now? How did I first come to be concerned about the healthy condition of my soul? For a long time, I continued to delight in those things that were on display and marketed at Vanity Fair. These were things that I now believe, had I continued in them, would have certainly led to my eternal damnation and destruction. What were these things in particular? All of the treasures and riches of the world. Also, I derived great pleasure from rioting, partying, drinking, swearing, dishonesty, lewdness, Sabbath-breaking, and much more, all of which tended to destroy my soul. But at last I discovered that by listening to and thinking about spiritual truth, this ungodly lifestyle would eventually lead to my death. I further understood that because of these carnal things, the wrath of God falls on the children of disobedience. Such truths I heard from you, as well as beloved faithful, who was put to death for his faith and godly living in Fenity Fair. And did this new understanding bring about an immediate burden of conviction? No, because... Right then, I was not willing to know about the evil of sin or the damnation that results from obeying it. On the contrary, when troubled with the word of truth, I made every effort to shut my eyes to its revealing light. But what was the cause of your continual resistance to these first workings of God's blessed Spirit upon you? The causes were, first, I was ignorant that this was the work of God upon me. I never understood that by means of awakening me to sin in my life, God first begins the conversion of a sinner. Second, sin was very sweet to my flesh, and I was most reluctant to forsake it. Third, I could not contemplate parting with my established worldly companions, for their friendship and lifestyle continued to be desirable to me. Fourth, those periods in which convictions of sin seized me were so troublesome and fearful to my heart that I could not endure them. No, not so much as the mere remembrance of them. Then in pushing them aside, it would seem that sometimes you could be rid of your trouble. Yes, that is true, but then it would return again into my mind so that I would be as bad, no, even worse than I was before. Tell me then, what was it that brought your sins to mind again? Many things. So just first, I, if I merely met a good man in the street, or second, if I heard anyone read from the Bible, or third, if my head began to ache, or fourth, if I was told that some of my neighbors were sick, or fifth, if I heard the bell toll for someone who had died, or sixth, if I thought of my own dying, seventh, if I heard that others had suddenly died, or eighth, but especially when I focused on my own imminent appointment with judgment. And at any time, could you easily be relieved of this guilt of sin? That is when any of these incidents confronted you. Oh no, and especially more recently, for on appearing they seemed so rapidly to grasp hold of my conscience, and then, if I did contemplate returning to my sin, though my mind was in opposition to this, the result would be double torment for me. And what did you think of doing then? I concluded that I must make every effort to improve my life. Otherwise, I believed I was certain to be damned. And did you actually carry out this resolve to reform your life? Yes, and I fled from not only my sins, but also a sinful companion as well. Furthermore, I devoted myself to religious duties such as praying, Bible reading, weeping over my sin, speaking to truth to my neighbors, and other matters. I was involved with so many of these practices that they are too numerous to mention. And did you regard yourself as better off on account of this religious involvement? 
Yes, that is for a while. But eventually, greater troubles seem to overwhelm me and rise way above the level of my reformations. And how could that possibly come about since you confess to attaining improvement in your life? There were several things that brought this upon me, and especially sayings such as, All our righteousness are as filthy rags, and by the works of the law no man shall be justified. And when you have done all things, say, we are unprofitable, and many more like these besides. So from this I begin to reason with myself as follows. If all my righteousness are as filthy rags, and if no man can be justified by the deeds of the law, and if when we have done all, we are still unprofitable, then it is sheer folly to think of attaining heaven by means or the law of or human performance. I further thought as follows. If a man runs up a debt of a hundred pounds at a local shop, and then subsequently pays cash for everything else that he buys, still the original debt remains unsettled. And in this case, the shopkeeper will probably sue him and have the debtor imprisoned until he pays the debt in full. Yes, I understand. But how does this apply to yourself? Well, I reasoned as follows concerning my own condition. Because of my sins caused me to be greatly indebted in God's book, and all my present reforming will not pay for what I owe, therefore I should ponder what use are all of these new improvements. For how shall I escape from the damnation that endangers me on account of my former transgressions? Another thing that troubled me, even concerning my recent amendments, was this. If I looked very closely into the best of what I now do, I still see sin, new sin, mixing itself with the best of what I do. So now I was forced to conclude that notwithstanding my former fond conceits regarding myself and my duties, yet I had committed enough sin and one duty to send me to hell, even though my former life had been faultless. And what did you do then? What did I do? Why, I was at a loss to know which way to turn. That is, until I laid bare my heart to faithful. For he and I were well acquainted with each other. So he told me that unless I could obtain the righteousness of a man who had never sinned, then neither mine nor all my righteousness, all the righteousness of the world, could save me. And were you convinced that he spoke the truth? Had he told me this when I was pleased with my own improvements, then I would have called him a fool for his trouble. But now... Having seen my own corruption and the sin that is attached to my own performance, my best performances, I have been forced to agree with this opinion. But when he first recommended to you a man who could be rightly be described as being sinless, did you believe that such a person could be found? I must confess, at first, his recommendation sounded strange. But after some further discussion and fellowship with the faithful, I became fully convinced that he was right. And did you ask him to identify this man and explain how you might be justified by him? Yes, and he told me it was the Lord Jesus Christ who dwells at the right hand of the Most High. So, he explained, you must be justified by him, that is, by trusting in what he accomplished in the days of his flesh when he suffered by hanging on the tree. Then I further asked, how is it that this man's righteousness could be effectual in justifying another man before God? And he told me that he was the mighty God, and that what he did in dying was not for himself, but for me. Furthermore, the righteousness of his doings and their worthiness would be imputed to me if I believed on him. And what did you do then? I offered objections as to why I should not believe, and especially because I thought this Christ was not willing to save me. And what did Faithful then say? He urged me to go to him and find out for myself, but I replied that I thought this was presumptuous. However, he said that this was not so, since I was invited to come. Then he gave me a book of Jesus, in which were his very words, and these only are all the more encouraged me to freely come to him. He added that every jot and tittle in this book were more firmly established than heaven and earth. So I asked him what I must do when I came to Christ. He told me that I must first fall to my knees and plead with all my heart and soul that the Father would reveal him to me. 
Then I asked him how I should make my entreaty to this Jesus. He responded that I should go and find him sitting on a mercy seat where he sits throughout each year, providing mercy and forgiveness for those who come to him. Then I told him that I would not know what to say when I did come. He directed me to speak in this manner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and enable me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I understand that if his righteousness was not available, or I did not have faith in that righteousness, then I would be utterly rejected. Lord, I have heard that you are a merciful God, and have ordained that your Son, Jesus Christ, should be the Savior of the world. And moreover, I understand that you are willing to confer him and his salvation upon poor sinners such as myself. And indeed, I am a poor sinner. Therefore, Lord, take this opportunity to magnify your grace and the salvation of my soul through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And did you do exactly as you were told? Yes, over and over and over again. And did the Father reveal his Son to you? Not on the first, the second, third, the fourth, the fifth, or even the sixth occasion. And what did you do? What did I do? Why, I did not know what to do. Did you ever consider giving up on praying? Yes, at least a hundred times, and then another hundred. Why is it that you did not give up? I believe that what had been told to me was true. That is, that without the righteousness of this Christ, all of the world could not save me. Therefore I thought to myself, if I cease making these entreaties, then I die, though I can only die at the throne of grace. And moreover, this came to my mind. If it delays, then wait for it, because it will certainly come, and will not delay. So I continued praying until the Father revealed His Son to me. And how was He eventually revealed to you? I did not see Him with my physical eyes, but rather with the eyes of my understanding. Now this is how it happened. One day, when I was particularly sad, I think I was more sad than at other times in my, sp in my life. And this bout of sadness came upon me through a fresh sight of the greatness and vileness of my sins. So, as I was then anticipating nothing else but hell and the everlasting damnation of my soul, suddenly I thought I saw the Lord Jesus look down from heaven towards me and then beckon me with this invitation, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. But I replied, Lord, I am a great, indeed, a very great sinner. To this he answered, My grace is sufficient for you. Then I said, But Lord, what exactly is, is it to believe? Immediately I understood from that saying, He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. That believing and coming mean the same thing. Therefore, he who comes to Christ, that is, runs to Him because of a heart overflowing with earnest desires for salvation by Christ, is he who truly believes in Christ. I further heard Him say, And he who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. Then I said, But Lord, how must I properly think about you in coming to you? That is, how should my faith rightly behold you? Then He responded, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He died for our sins and rose again for our justification. He loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. He is the mediator between God and us. He ever lives to make intercession for us. From all of this, I came to understand that I must look for righteousness in His person and for satisfaction from my sins through His blood and that what he did in obedience to his father's law and in submitting to its attending penalty was not for himself, but for he who will accept it for his salvation and be thankful. As a consequence, my heart now became full of joy, while my eyes flooded with tears. Now my affections overflowed with love for the name, the people, and ways of Jesus Christ. This was truly a revelation of Christ to your soul. But tell me in more detail what effect this encounter had upon your spirit. 
it made me understand that all of the world, notwithstanding its vaunted righteousness, is yet in a state of condemnation. It made me see that God the Father, while being just, can also justify the believing sinner. It made me greatly ashamed of the vileness of my former lifestyle and amazed that I could be so ignorant in this condition. For up till that time, no thought had come to my heart that revealed the beauty of Jesus Christ. It made me love a holy life and long to do something for the honor and glory of the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes, I now considered that if I had a thousand gallons of blood in my body, I would gladly spill it all for the sake of the Lord Jesus. It's. Uh, I think I kind of maybe see where, where John Bunyan is getting at, maybe by naming Hopeful, like behind Hopeful's name, is because in his testimony, where you see like where he comes from, uh, maybe I'm kind of, I mean, I'm kind of making this up, so maybe it's not mm-hmm. exactly, but um, looking at his testimony, seeing where, where he came from to where he is now, so he was in the... The city that where were the Vanity city Fair. Vanity Fair, mm-hmm. and drinking and, and giving into all these other things, and then to coming to trying to live righteously, but then still seeing sin in his life, and then coming to Christ. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of hope there, like in that in that testimony, like seeing from where he's come from. So, yeah, that's just my first take. But yeah, absolutely, uh, and in a sense, every Christian is mm-hmm. a hopeful. Right? Yeah, and and. Uh, I think I, I, when you started that question or, or your uh, little dissertation, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I thought it was I interesting because in a sense, every, and then I thought about faithful, like what kind of Christian faithful is, but in a sense, all our brothers and sisters are like hopeful and faithful to us, mm-hmm. all true brothers and sisters, right? Yeah. Because they inspire us with hope uh, at times when we need it. And I think Christian has already experienced hopefuls, hope giving hope. Uh, in his life, and also mm-hmm. faithful uh, faith and, and the encouragement that, that he has given him. Yeah. But, uh, well, yeah. kind of like you said with what John Bunyan, how he wrote this story, is he kind of takes the whole complete aspect of the Christian life and kind of lays it out in strips so you can yeah. kind of see each angle. It's probably like what he's doing here as well with these characters. But mm-hmm. Actually, one of the questions I had is, why did it take so long for God to answer Hopeful's prayers? Because it seemed like he was praying for a while wasn't it? And then, but he didn't give up. Um, he kept praying that God would reveal the son to him. You know, I, when I was reading this, I was reminded of, of uh, our time in the Netherlands, of people seeking God for a while and then finding him. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is really foreign to at least, you know, big evangelical Christianity today. Mm-hmm. Um, we expect, or we, we almost come to the point of pushing people that, uh, hey, you want to be a Christian? Okay, let's get you through this real quick. Uh, and this yeah. is what you got to do. You know, you got to believe in Jesus, then get baptized, join a church, uh, and then live your Christian life, and then it starts. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather than really seeking God for true conversion, which I think is problematic. Uh, I think a lot of people have false conversions today because they never really seek God. But if you go back into history uh, from the Puritans, but also uh, Reformed, uh, Presbyterian, Baptist, uh, George Whitfield's time, John Wesley's, if you read all these testimonies, there's a seeking after God. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, a great example. Uh, David Brainerd himself um, in his uh, uh, life and diary talks about this. Uh, In my own life, uh, mm-hmm. It's from a kind of the time where I began to reform myself to become a Christian until I actually was born again was two years or so, mm-hmm. round about. Um, so like a seeking, and I thought I was saved in the beginning when I, uh, kind of like the way that Hopeful describes, that's very similar to my own testimony, where I tried to reform my life and now I'm going to be a Christian, identified as a Christian, all of that. Um, but it was kind of that up and down type of uh, idea that uh, I tried really hard, then I was kind of discouraged, I cried over my sin, then I tried again, that type, but there wasn't a real knowing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, And when the Bible says, seek and you will find, or seek earnestly, Jesus is preaching that again and again, like an actual seeking earnestly after God. Nicodemus for example, is a good biblical example of this. Mm -hmm. He comes to Jesus with questions. He wants to meet Christ. Uh, And by the end of the book of John, I think he's he's a genuine believer. Mm -hmm. 
but there is a seeking after God, especially if you're, um, um, because it's a wrestling of the soul, right? And and if you think about uh, becoming a Christian as a battle between um, uh, really like Satan who's trying to hold you and the gospel truth seeking to penetrate your heart, uh, if this is to be genuine, it usually takes some time. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, I'm not, it doesn't have to. I mean, somebody can be saved in one minute. But often, genuine conversion takes time because there's a wrestling of the soul. Um, Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Yeah. That implies that it takes some time. It's not, okay, righteous sin, just boom, saved. Yeah. Right? So, um, I think the reason why this kind of stands out for us is because we have so many fake conversions of people that just kind of get run through some Mm -hmm. intellectual steps of, okay, do you recognize that you've done mistakes? Yeah. All right. Do you recognize that you need a Savior, otherwise you go to hell? Yeah. All right. Here's Jesus. Do you accept Him? Yes. But it's not accepting. It's believing. Mm -hmm. It's trusting. It's turning from one to another. And for most souls, most people with souls, um, I think this, uh, there's a wrestling in the soul. And it's not so much that um, hopeful himself uh, or that God says, well, I'm not going to accept you yet. It's more that hopeful is uh, wavering between two thoughts. He likes the world and he wants to come to God. And that's the wrestling. And as soon as he comes to the conviction that uh, God is much better, and he really has a turning away from the world, then immediately he comes to know Christ. Wow, yeah, I think a lot of people need to <clears throat> hear that today because um, I think so often, especially like in the Western uh, culture, it's it's very, at least our culture, I think, feels a lot that they're wrestling between pursuing God or just pursuing, you know, entertainment or wealth and a lot of things like that. Um, so, I think it's important for us to remember that this uh, Christian life is a lot of wrestling like we need to go through a lot of that yeah i mean you you really set me off on that with that one yeah i guess because you know in our modern culture people really don't know what wrestling is Mm, right what what really wrestling for i mean um i remember long nights of wrestling of seeking god of 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 struggling uh, of uh, wanting to and and really that, that kind of fight right that um, and I think we live in a McDonald's culture where uh, if you want something, you go get it uh, and you don't care if it's healthy or not. You just want to satisfy a temporary pleasure. And I think Christianity is sometimes treated that way. Like, uh, okay, I'll just, I'll see if Christianity works for me. Mm-hmm. No, you count the cost, Jesus said. If you're going to go out with one army to the next uh, and against your enemy, you count the cost if you can complete it. If you can win the battle, uh, if you're going to build a house, you need to sit down and calculate if you can finish building this construction, if you can yeah. build, finish it. In the same way, when you want to turn from darkness to light, from the kingdom of Satan and this world to the kingdom of God, uh, it's a battle. It's mm-hmm. wrestling. It's seeking after Him. And uh, when I'm, I've counseled many people in private that, that said, well, I, I want to know God. And I, and I want to know if the Holy Spirit's working in them. So I said, well, how serious are you about this? Hmm. Because I can lead you to God by His grace, because that's what He's sent me out to do in this world. But if you're going to be a, if you're going to set the parameters of the wrestling, the struggling, and the seeking after God, we don't even have to start. Yeah. If, if you want something quick and easy, because you're going to go through some difficulties and you're not ready to follow a new Lord, die to yourself, uh, take up your cross, uh, take up your cross, deny, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Him. I can't lead you to Him because you're seeking for another God. Mm-hmm. But if you're willing to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Him, we can. I can help you find Him. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think what hopeful, the reason why hopeful's testimony stands out so much is because we have so much fake and false converts today, which which you find in the world, right? And so, oh, you really set me off here. So <laughs> oh, maybe I did myself. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> but but I think what's happened is 
now, right now, the church is filled with so many false converts, goats, and not sheep, that then we try to change the church to satisfy all these pleasures, but people have never wrestled uh, you know, with God uh, alone, or even with their own thoughts, uh, and, and seek the scriptures and, and wrestle against um, uh, their their inability to be saved and save themselves and find and discover that no matter how hard they try, they fail. So that they don't appreciate Christ. They are not under His Lordship. They don't want to serve Him. And so they want their Christianity to enjoy and and kind of tickle their flesh. right? And so as soon as it doesn't satisfy, they want to hop to somewhere else and then they're deconstructing something they never constructed in the first place. Mm-hmm. Right, but true Christianity is a wrestling of the soul and finding God. It's it's the new birth. Yeah. I mean, what's the biggest event in your life? Well, it was your birth <laughs> that started yeah. it all, uh, yeah. right? So, um, in the same way, the greatest thing in the, in, in the Christian life is your new birth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if people say, "Well, you know, do I really have to wrestle? Uh, maybe potentially for months?" Yeah, mm-hmm. right. I, I remember. I can give you. I can call people in and give you the people of testimonies that wrestled for months and months. Uh, I remember uh, one particular brother uh, that's uh, you know, one of my best friends, if not my best friend, um, that we uh, we spent three months. I, we actually traveled out of the country in the Netherlands to spend uh, time searching the scriptures and dealing with his soul and answering questions and going out into the field to pray and, and seeking God until we found God. Because he didn't want something that he manufactured. He wanted to meet the living God. Yeah. Um, and that's Christianity. And once you have that, oh, I mean, the, uh, what style you worship or how long the sermon takes or what the building looks like or how hip mm-hmm. the pastor is, is all superfluous. Right? It, it, it's, yeah. uh, it, it doesn't matter anymore. You want the truth and you want to you wanna be closer to God. And you want to have real fellowship with real people because Christ becomes everything. So well, I'm thankful for this yeah. voice of the past of reason. Yeah, no, it's so interesting because we only took like one piece of it and we're able to like get a whole conversation going. That was something that is really important. I think a lot of us are missing today this this idea of wrestling. We will catch you in the next episode where we have a conversation about how closer acquaintance is made with ignorance. We hope that you will join us for our next episode. And um, goodbye for now. Thank you for listening to the Pilgrim's Well podcast. For more, be sure to follow us from wherever you're listening from, whether it be from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. To find us online, go to seventhref.org. We'll see you in the next episode.